Thank you for joining and welcome to another consultation and discussion for the study on environmental and social risk assessments and management consultations of the Asian Development Bank. This consultation forms part of the stakeholder engagement that supports the safeguard policy review and update process or the SPRU as you may hear us refer to it as. My name is Azim Manji, your consultation moderator for this session. This is our 11th thematic consultation topic or theme so far. And this is the fifth or the final one in a series of consultations and discussions on environmental and social risk assessment specifically. In today's consultation, we are joined not only by Bruce Dunn, the director of SDCC in the Asian Development Bank, but also by Ryder Kwam and also Charles Deleva, both of whom are internationally recognized specialists in this area. Other experts, including Zara Abbas, Felix Oku and Madhumita Gupta are also here and joining in the consultation as and will be presenting materials and engaging with you for the discussion, as well as responding to feedback. For this fifth session on the theme of environmental and social risk assessment with CSOs in South Asia, Central and West Asia, we have about 62 participants registered from about an hour ago. I'm sure that number will rise as we proceed through the consultation. 42 of you are from outside the ADB network, which is exciting and interesting. Highlights of the participant countries represented in this CSO consultation include nine from India, four from Uzbekistan and Sri Lanka, and others including from Bangladesh, Nepal, the Maldives, Armenia, Bhutan, and Georgia in no particular order. There's one advanced question which has been submitted via email prior to this session. In this consultation, Mr. Ryder Kwam will present the main summary issues related to the study he has authored on environmental and social risk assessment and the relationship of the study of relevance to the safeguards policy update. From the presentations, we're hoping that participants like yourselves will share insights on the potential gaps of the provision and implementation of the 2009 policy, and also propose recommendations to ensure the strengthening of the forthcoming or future revised policy. Comments received from this consultation will inform the revision of ADB safeguards policy. Before I call upon our speakers, here's a few gentle meeting reminders. As you've seen when you join the meeting, you've all consented, myself included, to the recording and eventual distribution of the recording for this meeting. As I mentioned, it's the intention that these recordings will be available to ADB staff and consultants, and then more broadly to all members of this consultation publicly. If you have any concerns about this, please contact the Secretariat at the email address posted in the chat box. Please join from a quiet, distraction-free area, ensuring that your microphone and video are off when not speaking. And during the question and answer session, when invited to do so, you may ask questions by typing them into the chat box or through raising your hand virtually. You will then be asked to unmute yourself and turn on your camera so we can hear and see you live. As we're all colleagues here, Let's be respectful and ensure a collegial atmosphere and allow everyone to participate. Felix and I will manage the time of this consultation to keep with our schedule as well as yours. IT support will be provided throughout the duration of this consultation. And you may ask for support by typing your issue or query into the chat box in any of the languages we're using today. A few guidance notes when using the important Zoom buttons. Aside from English, we have simultaneous interpretation in Hindi, Russian, and Urdu today. To access the simultaneous interpretations feature as shown on the slide, click on the globe icon found on the lower part of your screen 
and select one of the preferred languages. Press the mute original audio button so you can hear the voice of your interpreter and not the original English speaker. For those of you listening in Hindi, Russian, or Urdu, if you feel the simultaneous interpretation is proceeding too quickly, please, if you feel the simultaneous interpretation is proceeding too quickly and the interpreter is struggling to match the pace of the English speaker, you can ask the original speaker to slow down or possibly speed up by going to the bottom of the Zoom screen and clicking on the reactions button. When you've clicked on reactions, you can then press the slow down button, which is two reverse arrows that point to the left in white, or the speed up button, which is two fast forward arrows pointing to the right in blue. This will let the English speaker know to speed up or slow down accordingly. We ask that you use your proper name in Zoom for our documentation. To change your name in Zoom, click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Then on the right-hand side of your screen, look for your own name. Click on the more button on the right-hand side of your name, then click the rename button. Type in your name, the agency you represent, and then click OK. If you wish to send a message, question, or share feedback, click on the chat button. If you wish to comment or raise a question or share experience in the language you prefer, click on the smile icon or the reactions button, and then click on the raise hand emoji. Then to speak, unmute yourself, click on the microphone button. To show your video, you can click on the video icon. The next slide shows how we value diverse and informed feedback from our wide range of stakeholders. I'll allow you to read the slide and won't be detailing everything that's on that slide. The slide refers to ADB's commitment to meaningful consultations. Just another reminder that these sessions are being recorded and documented and will subsequently be distributed during and for each event. This allows the ADB to review, consider and respond to, if necessary, any comments and inputs made during the consultations. If you wish to opt out of the recording and or distribution of the recordings, please contact the Secretariat through the email address at the bottom of the screen. If you have any issues or concerns on recording, confidentiality, potential risks, abuse, or any other kind of discrimination during the course of these consultations, please get in touch with the Secretariat through the email address that's being flashed in the chat box now. For this consultation, we have about two hours, and here's what we have planned to maximize both your time as well as ours. First, Mr. Bruce Dunn will provide his welcome remarks. Mr. Dunn is the director of the Safeguards Division in ADB's Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. Second, Mr. Ryder Kwam will share the main issues and findings of the nature and context of the study on environmental and social risk assessment as related to the revision of the Safeguards policy statement and its forthcoming update. After this second presentation by Ryder, we will have a brief five minute break and when we, re we <laughs> and when we resume, we will be joined by our third presentation by Ms. Zara Abbas, a principal environment specialist in the Safeguards Division, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, who will frame the discussion and set the context for the question and answer session on environmental and social risk assessments. Following Zara, we will have a moderated discussion as facilitated by Mr. Felix Ni Tete Oku, a senior social development specialist also in the Safeguards Division. This will be a Q&A session that runs for approximately 70 minutes. A reminder that you may ask your questions and share experiences in the chat box in either English, Hindi, Russian, or Urdu. Felix will prompt us with guide questions to frame the conversation. Please then join us for a quick event evaluation before turning you back to Bruce Dunn to give us a wrap up and the next steps following this consultation.
As such, and without further ado, I'd like to call upon Mr. Bruce Dunn for his welcome and int introductory remarks. Bruce? Thank you very much, Azim, and good day. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today for this regional consultation on environmental and social impact and risk assessment being held as part of the update of ADB's 2009 Safeguard Policy Statement. As Azim has just mentioned, this regional consultation is the 11th thematic topic that we have held since starting the stakeholder engagement process in last November 2021. And we're actually going to be continuing this process with a, a series of further consultations and we'll be holding about 20 sessions in total. Uh, you can find further information about the upcoming topics on our website and also we'll be uh, dropping the links for these in the chat box. Now I see that many of you have joined previous sessions and I do want to thank you very much for, for coming back. It's really valuable that we can have a sort of continuous dialogue through these consultations and really build up uh, a consistent sort of body of understanding around the directions that we're thinking of taking with the policy update and your views on that. Uh, these consultations are designed to um, be an opportunity for us to listen about your experiences and to hear your recommendations so that we can feed that into the next stage of drafting the policy. Now, for any of you that are joining these consultations for the first time, and I, I do believe there are some looking at the participants list today, I'd like to just briefly mention a little bit of further background on the process. Now, ADB launched the update of the Safeguard Policy Statement in August 2020, and this followed a evaluation of the existing policy by ADB's Independent Evaluation Department, and that was completed in May 2020. And that evaluation study recommended that ADB should modernize the existing policy, building on evidence from the SBS implementation experience, as well as looking at recent safeguard policy updates by other multilateral financial institutions. So we've been taking this forward now by undertaking analytical studies to look at implementation experience, as well as benchmarking our existing policy against those of other multilateral financial institutions. Now the process to update the policy is expected to run over about a two and a half year period with the approval of the new policy targeted by March 2023. So we still have about a year to go in this process and we'll be continuing with consultations uh, throughout uh, the next few months. Then we'll be working on the development of the uh, new policy and we're targeting to have a draft of that available by about September this year and then we will go into uh, further rounds of consultations after making the policy publicly available on our website. Uh, now as mentioned you can find further information on our website including the background paper that sets out the approach for the update as well as a stakeholder engagement plan. Now, coming for today's consultation session on strengthening an environmental and social impact and risk assessment. This really is a, a critical um, area of the policy. Um, it sets the framing for the application of many other um, environmental and social standards. And it's really important area that we need to get right. Uh, to set the scene for some of the further discussions, there are four points that I'd like to raise uh, here. Now, my first point is on the scope of risks that need to be assessed. For those of you that are familiar with ADB's SPS, you'll understand that it currently requires the screening and assessment of project related impacts and risks in the context of a project's area of influence. But that largely focuses on the primary project sites and associated facilities. And it includes consideration of direct, indirect, but also cumulative and induced impacts. However, there is 
I would say more limited or less consideration to the wider context in which a project takes place. So we feel that you know, consideration of wider contextual risks, and these are things like uh, fragility, conflict, uh, the situation in terms of governance and capacity, these types of issues are also crucial for our understanding around project risks. And this is an area that we would like to strengthen. Secondly, ADB currently screens and categorizes projects separately for environment, involuntary resettlement and indigenous people safeguards. In fact, we believe that we're uh, the only multilateral uh, institution that actually does this separate categorization. And what we found from our own experience, and this also came out from the independent evaluation, that we need to take a more integrated approach. We need to understand the uh, potential relationships between the environmental and social domains, and we need to have more robust social analysis to inform the process. So that's my second point. And my third point is on an understanding project impacts and risks to vulnerable and disadvantaged individuals and groups. Now, this is already part of the existing policy. However, the policy focuses or highlights in particular uh, risks to poor people, women and children, and Indigenous people for specific attention. But of course, there is a wider scope of uh, people that could be vulnerable. Uh, for example, people with disabilities, uh, people from different uh, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, uh, people of different uh, gender identities. And of course, there are intersectionality issues that need to be considered as well. So my third point there is really we need to take a broader approach for considering uh, vulnerability and disadvantage in the new policy. And then my fourth and final point is on the need for more uh, adaptive and risk-based management approaches across the entire project cycle. Now, generally, ADB requires that impact assessments are prepared in full before project approval. So in practice, we tend to be quite front loaded. Um, assessments are undertaken and the level of detail tends to be similar regardless of the, the level of risks and regardless of whether detailed designs have been prepared at that stage. In fact, many of the projects that we prepare are based on feasibility studies with detailed designs still to be completed uh, at later stages. And most of the human resources, due diligence, appraisal efforts focus on this very early stage. However, we realize that greater attention is needed across the project cycle. Um, we need to obviously prepare projects based on uh, their potential risks, but a lot more focus is needed on the implementation stage. But we need to look very carefully at this balance and it's going to be very important that we get this right so that we can allocate sufficient resources at the right time. So with these four issues uh, in terms of um, the scope of risks to be assessed, the integration of risks, the consideration of vulnerability and disadvantaged groups, and then also the need for an adaptive and risk-based approach. These, these four points I think are very important. And we're going to be focusing on these in more detail during this session. Now with that, I'd like to now pass over to uh, my two colleagues. Uh, firstly, Mr. Ryder Farm. He's going to be uh, presenting the findings of the analytical study. Uh, he's a senior advisor that's supporting the ADB uh, with this work. And then after his presentation, we'll take a short break. And then my colleague, Ms. Sarah Abbas, will be speaking a little bit more about some of the directions that ADB is thinking about taking. We do have a little bit more presentation material uh, in today's session than we have had in previous sessions, because we think it's important to have a thorough look at the issues. But then we will, of course, be setting aside uh, plenty of time 
for hearing your views and recommendations. And, and that's really why we are here today. So um, we will provide enough time, uh, as long as you're willing to stay with us, uh, to hear uh, your views and recommendations. So with that, let me now pass over to Ryder for the first presentation. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Bruce, and hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. Um, I'm a social anthropologist by background. I have worked on environmental and social safeguards in different positions with the World Bank and the IFC. And I've also worked on these issues with the Inter-American Development Bank Group. Uh, and I've, take, I've conducted a comparative study between ADB's 2009 safeguards policy statement and current good and emerging practice as exemplified by some of the other multilateral financial institutions. So if we could have the next slide, please, just to give a quick outline. Uh, I've tried to identify some of the gaps in the safeguards policy statement compared with current and emerging good practice and uh, to try to think of ways in which the ADB can incorporate this practice in their updated policy framework. This is primarily done on the basis of a desk study of publicly available information, plus my own experience having worked with these different institutions. Next slide, please. The six comparator institutions, as you see here, they all have policy frameworks that are more recent than the ADB's safeguards policy statement. It's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the World Bank, IFC, the private sector part of the World Bank Group, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IDB, which is the public sector part of the Inter-American Development Bank Group, and also the private part of that group, the IDB Invest. And you can see that these have policies that have been adopted in recent years. And they are converging around a common set of principles and topics that they address. And they're also converging around a similar type of architecture for the entire policy framework. Next slide, please. There are a number of things we have looked at in this study and discussed, uh, but just, just to point out a few of the highlights here. First and foremost, I think, is a more balanced and integrated approach to environmental and social considerations. As you know, uh, national laws on environmental impact assessment and similar approaches have tended to focus more in the past on the physical environment, and there has been less attention to social issues. The new policy frameworks attempt to balance these issues. They note and spell out a bit more explicitly different topics and risk considerations, uh, whether it is on gender issues, on vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, and other aspects, and to balance this with the environmental assessment process. So we now tend not to talk about just an EIA or an environmental assessment. We prefer to talk about an environmental and social assessment process. Secondly, there is awareness that affected communities and other stakeholders have not been sufficiently involved in defining projects through a participatory planning process and consultations and engagement. So modern frameworks stress the issue of stakeholder engagement to a far greater degree than the older frameworks did. We have moved, as Bruce indicated, to from focusing primarily on pre-approval actions, those things that needed to be done before a project could be approved uh, with studies and plans, those remain important, 
but we try to balance that with increased attention to what happens during implementation, more support, more capacity building, and better monitoring and attention to issues that emerge. So this is what we mean by a compre more comprehensive risk management system. It looks at different risk factors, tries to address them through upfront pl planning, but also tries to continue to monitor, study, and consult on these issues during implementation. The fourth point, greater clarity on roles and responsibilities between the lender and the client. Uh, there has been some confusion about that. Uh, it should be clear that the planning and the implementation, design issues, other aspects, remain a client responsibility. The lending institution, such as ADB, has a duty of due diligence, of doing their own independent verification and assessment of risks, uh, and to provide assistance uh, in implementation, capacity building, and other aspects to support the client in doing this work. As we said, we've gone from focusing primarily on pre-approval actions to really emphasizing results and outcomes and objectives and principles of these standards. Rather than just procedural compliance with documentation, we try to balance this now with a focus on results. In order to nuance the approach and to understand the combination of risk factors better, we've also in some cases moved from and the traditional risk categorization that the development lending institution does, category A, B, C is the typical, to a four-tier scale of high, substantial, moderate, or low risk. Uh, this allows for better calibration of efforts and requirements, better nuancing, uh, so that not everything gets lumped into the middle of a category B project, which often tended to happen. Taking account of all these different risk factors uh, also means that each project in some sense is unique. Uh, local settings, cultural values, power dynamics and relationships in a community, uh, capacity of the implementing agency, the role of supporting uh, NGOs and civil society organizations, whatever it may be, it will vary from context to context. And so it is also recognized now that you cannot do a very rigid or have a very rigid checklist and say, this is how we're going to apply this mechanically in every situation. Applying a nuanced risk management framework will require judgment which comes with experience. And we're still learning about all of these things. And we're looking forward to your inputs to build that common platform of shared learning and knowledge. It does require flexibility. It does require being able to respond to unforeseen circumstances throughout the entire life of a project. And so the efforts and the requirements, whether it's before approving a project or during its implementation, will need to be proportionate to the project risk and scale and complexity. Higher risk projects will require a great deal more effort. Next slide, please. I apologize for the small font, but you will get copies of these slides. They, I understand they can be downloaded. This is a way, an attempt to simplify and illustrate the uh, architecture that is emerging as common practice among the MFIs. It's in three levels or three tiers. At the top is a series of aspirational statements and goals, what you might call a vision statement. Uh, this is going above and beyond the mandatory risk management. It states basically that uh, in the assessment process, and in the management of environmental and social considerations in a project, we should not just be satisfied with risk mitigation and 
restoring baseline conditions or the status quo, we should look for ways to improve on existing conditions, promote environmental and social sustainability, and broader goals such as those related to climate change, uh, meeting the sustainable development goals, meeting commitments in international con conventions, and so on. At the mandatory level of requirements, there's also really two levels within that. One is a series of policies and standards that contain the key principles, the objectives, of the process and the different topics to be looked at, whether it is resettlement or whether it is cultural heritage or attention to indigenous peoples. Typically now, these policies are separate and very clearly defined when it comes to the lender's institution, in this case, the ADB, and the client's borrower's responsibility, whether it been whether that be a government agency or a private sector company. The lending institution has a responsibility of due diligence, as we said, of uh, applying the overall objectives to its approach, of meeting its own access to information and disclosure policies, uh, of having processes for project selection and for categorizing risk and for assigning the appropriate level of effort and support to projects depending on risk levels. On the client side, there will be a series of standards that they are responsible for, and these are typically modeled on the IFC performance standards. Uh, standard one, environmental and social assessment and management of, of risks, or sorry, assessment and management of environmental and social risks and impacts is sort of an umbrella standard uh, containing the core principles of the approach and the other standards typically focus on particular topics and issues as we've said resettlement uh, cultural heritage labor and working relations so in this presentation and this study we've taken the standard one as the starting point to see the core principles and to try to see how they align across different institutions the next level down contains procedures and organizational structure, uh, management systems, staffing, resources, uh, and ways of addressing different lending mod modalities, which will have to be differentiated, whether we're talking about a grant, a technical assistance program, an investment uh, project, a development project, uh, policy lending approach, or other ways of engaging and supporting clients. So procedures will have to be somewhat differentiated depending on what the modality is. And finally, at the bottom, uh, guidance tools and good practice. This is non mandatory. This is advisory work. Uh, could be handbooks that have been published on a regular basis. Good practice notes. I'm sure you're familiar with some of the more recent ones. We've, uh, the institutions have published good ha practice handbooks on issues such as use of security forces, uh, better attention to animal welfare issues, uh, a recent, uh, recently published handbook on how to recognize and avoid violence against stakeholders and retaliation. Uh, so all of these keep being produced and shared and co coordinated to the extent possible uh, among these different multilateral financial institutions now. Next slide, please. And I will try to go a little bit more quickly. Just to try to illustrate some of the comprehens more comprehensive approaches to risk identification, first of all, to finding out what the risks in a project settings are. The project is concerned with identifying and avoiding or mitigating risks of adverse impacts that the project itself may cause to people or the environment. This has the, is at the core of what we've always talked about as do no harm policies. And those can be direct or indirect as in the first point. Direct as in direct attribution to the project, resettlement and displacement, for example, 
or more indirect, such as cumulative impacts where other third parties are also involved. But beyond that, there are several other aspects. Different sectors, such as a hydroelectric power plant, a mining project, would have far higher risks normally than, for example, a health or an education project. Thirdly, it matters where you're doing it, and it matters who is involved and affected. Uh, a good risk analysis would take account of the vulnerability and sensitivity in the operating environment. Are there biodiversity hotspots? Are there critical natural habitats? Is the area particularly affected by climate related events? And on the social side, are there vulnerable or disadvantaged groups based on a number of different criteria? And we'll talk briefly about that in a later slide. It could be gender, ethnicity, persons with disabilities, other factors. The project is also operating in a larger context, contextual risk factors such as, is there conflict and violence in the setting? Are there historical legacy issues of abuses or mistrust between a community and the government, for example? Governance and corruption, what are those risks? And finally, this needs to be coordinated and managed well. So the capacity, the political will and commitment of the responsible agencies involved matters a great deal. And establishing a robust management system for environmental and social risk assessment and management is critical here. And it's something I think we did not focus enough on in the past, the whole institutional uh, aspect of risk management. Next slide, please. We've said that the effort and sequencing needs to be proportionate to the risk once we've identified and try to say, is this a high risk project? Is this a low risk project? So if we click on the next part of this slide, we've tried to illustrate here that in a typical project timeline, uh, the life cycle of a project from concept through closing, there are different stages and phases. At one point, the project is approved and a contract is signed between the ADB in this case and a government or a private sector company. Uh, and so some things are done before the project is approved and some things are done after. Studies may need to be continued. Stakeholder engagement will continue as a process. So the level of effort and the number of actions and when things are done will vary. If we click on the next, this can be illustrated in the low risk situation by these green balls. Not too many actions, perhaps, not too much effort for each of them, and many of them can be done after the project is approved. In contrast, if we click on the high risk aspects, the next point, this is meant to illustrate in a high risk situation, you'll require a great many more actions, whether they be studies, consultation events, specific mitigation plans uh, and mechanisms. Uh, there will be more effort involved in each and correspondingly probably higher cost and more time. And more of them will need to be done upfront before the project is approved. This does not mean that it ends at approval. And this has been a mistake I think many of us have made in the past. We fo focused so much on the preparation side of things that we literally dropped the ball, these red balls, during implementation. Uh, there was not sufficient follow-up with intensified efforts, more support, uh, and continued requirements and actions. At the dotted line here that you see, when the project is approved, the approach now is to try to identify the high level actions, key principles and approaches and expected, expected milestones and outcomes during implementation and to specify that as part of the legal agreement that is signed in something that is either called a commitment plan or an action plan. 
an environmental and social commitment plan. Next slide, please. Some examples of things that may be sequenced into implementation are, for example, to finalize a biodiversity assessment. Uh, it could be that this, there was not enough time to take account of seasonal variations and animal migration patterns, for example. It could be that the site-specific areas, the impact areas of the project, have not yet been determined. And it could be that we would have a framework for stakeholder for, for resettlement, if we think there will be displacement and resettlement. And that, that would be made into more concrete site-specific action plans once the designs become completed. Uh, there could be a number of things. Stakeholder engagement will need to continue. It will need to be nuanced and updated uh, based on experience and involvement of communities and changing concerns and considerations based on that consultation process. So if we click on this, we can see that as these things are agreed on in a commitment plan, there may be studies and consultations undertaken later. Next click, please. Those should lead to management decisions. They should lead to the social and environmental risks and opportunities and the views and perceptions of stakeholders being reflected in updated and revised plans and designs. If we then click on the next, we will see that it will be a requirement that implementing mitigation measures such as relocation in a case of resettlement will need to take place before the final click here on the slide, which is you do not start with civil works or those things that may have adverse impacts until you've undertaken a robust process of what we generally refer to as applying a mitigation hierarchy of identifying risks, consulting on them, minimizing or avoiding the risks where possible and mitigating and compensating for any residual negative impacts that the project uh, has led to. The expectation here, the aspiration is that this should lead to a situation within a specified timeline of no net harm being done to either people or to the environment and ideally net positive gain. Next slide, please. The assessment process itself, identifying environmental and social issues, has also broadened from being a fairly narrow focus on environmental impacts, as I said, maybe pollution related issues, to being broader, more comprehensive and more balanced between environmental topics, as illustrated here on the left, and social topics, recognizing that these are interrelated. Ecosystem services are defined as those aspects of the natural environment that have value for people. So they're environmental and social aspects. Similarly, people's actions affect the natural environment. Uh, but these are just some example of topics that may require specialized attention. This is addressed in a process, and I want to stress this here, that this is a process. We've illustrated this as an umbrella because within this overall approach of looking at different topics in an early screening stage, we will prioritize and focus on particular issues that will require more attention in a particular project. So you may need a specialized study on biodiversity, on pollution related issues, on tangible and intangible access aspects of cultural heritage on risks of labor and working conditions if there's child labor or sl slave labor in the supply chain, for example. All of these may require specialized expertise and special attention, but you start out with a broad set of issues that you want to try to consider, and then you focus and prioritize as you go along. And this is both analytical and participatory because an input into understanding the context and the likely impacts of the project will be the consultation process with the affected communities and other stakeholders. Next slide, please. Focusing particularly 
in this process on vulnerable and disadvantaged groups is essential. And uh, there are basically four areas of focus. One is to recognize that people who are vulnerable, disadvantaged, poor, live with disabilities, others may be, for various reasons, affected more negatively by any adverse impact, such as resettlement, or such as loss of access to natural resources, than many other groups. So the negative impact, the risk to them may be higher. The second point is about benefits, a health project, an education project, a new transport and road project, all of those carry benefits, even when there's no direct negative impact from them, uh, but the, the benefits are not evenly distributed. There are often winners, but there are those who win more than others and those who win less. There may be systemic barriers to accessing those benefits through discrimination, through language related issues, through being an ethnic minority, through perhaps being a Dalit or an Adivasi person or a group. So social exclusion may prevent access to benefits and may uh, sometimes lead to elite capture of benefits. Thirdly, we know that uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged groups may not be able to participate as fully in a consultation process. They're sometimes ignored altogether, not consulted, uh, but in the large public setting, for example, it will often be the more powerful who speak. I lived many years in Bangladesh. I worked in communities and villages there. And often if a large meeting was held in a village, it tended to be the men who spoke and the women not so much in public. And one would need other ways of engaging, for example, focus groups or one-on-one -on -one conversations. And the same type of pattern you see based on all kinds of different social identities in different settings. And fourth point, going above and beyond uh, risk management, how can development opportunities be targeted to benefit vulnerable and disadvantaged groups? These social identities, whether it is gender, whether it is having a disability, whether it is age related, uh, that could lead to discrimination also, these do not operate separately or function in isolation. So if we click one more time on this slide, we will see the concept of intersectionality, that individuals and groups have often multiple sources of vulnerability. You may be an illiterate indigenous woman dependent on natural resources. Uh, there, all of these things may come together and mean that you're particularly vulnerable to project adverse impacts that, for example, uh, lead to a reduction in livelihood opportunities from the natural environment. Age, poverty levels, religion, sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, all of these may matter and should be considered, but not in isolation. They interact with each other. So a nuanced social analysis in the process project will try to identify individuals and groups that require particular attention based on a combination of factors. Next slide, please. Very quickly, uh, it's difficult to read the text here. This suggests, and it's an indicative list, there could be other ways of framing this, but it suggests some typical elements in an environmental and social assessment process as a process, not as a single study, but as the process with specific milestones and deliverables throughout the lifetime of the project, from concept and identification, preparation, through the approval process, implementation and completion and closure. And just to take some examples here, the early screening and scoping and prioritization of issues that I mentioned, we do that early, that's point two. Stakeholder engagement is an ongoing process throughout the lifetime of the project. That's point three, identifying benefits and risks and addressing those, a lot of effort upfront, but a continued attention to it during the lifetime of the project. 
responding to unforeseen circumstances. Establish baseline data. And then the point of integrating environmental and social issues into project design is number seven here. Again, much of it done prior to approving a project, but recognizing that this needs to be updated and continued integrated into management decisions. And I do want to stress that point because this really represents a new way of looking at it, a shift, if you like, in mental models around addressing environmental and social concerns. It used to be when I started working on these things that this was seen as an externality to the main project, if attention was given to it at all. Now the assumption is that environmental and social considerations and inputs from stakeholder consultations, different groups, views and perceptions should be considered and integrated into decisions around how the projects are designed and how they're implemented. So it is no longer seen as a separate responsibility just of environmental or social specialists, but it's seen as a management responsibility that needs to be coordinated and integrated with other factors such as technical feasibility, uh, economic rate of return, and everything else that we look at in a project. So this is established through the management system and is reflected in ongoing evaluation, monitoring, adaptive management throughout the lifetime of the project. One more slide on this perhaps is the next slide. Uh, so summarizing, coming to an end here, uh, trying to look at some of these factors that we could discuss and consider. Good practice would indicate that there should be an integrated framework. It should balance the environmental and social, assess social factor. This should be defined not as a study by itself or a point in time, but as an ongoing process. And that I would say has three core elements or core pillars, this process. It is an analytical process of using primary and secondary data, of using qualitative and quantitative data and indicators, number one, to understand what the issues are. Number two, it's a participatory process of involving and engaging with different stakeholders at different stages in a transparent manner. And number three, it's an operational management process that integrates the analytical work and the consultation process into management decisions throughout the lifetime, again, of the project. So it's analytical, participatory, and operational. And it's sometimes challenging to be able to integrate all of these things properly. Different people have been trained in different parts of this, and very few people have experience with an overall integration of all of these aspects. An academic will look at the analytical part, perhaps, uh, but may not have a lot of project management experience, which you also require. We've talked about better targeting when it comes to disadvantaged and vulnerable groups, including but not limited to gender considerations. Different risk categories, how they influence each other. We talked about the pro process as an ongoing uh, process during the whole project and to not just do the pre-approval actions, but have considerable emphasis on implementation and adjusting and adapting to changing circumstances uh, during a project's implementation. All of which means that as a management system, both, both the Asian Development Bank and its clients and borrowers, we need to develop structures and management systems where they're able to calibrate the effort and support to projects, uh, the resources needed, the oversight, the management support on, on the basis of looking at projects' risk levels, the scale and complexity of the projects. This is something that has taken institutions years and we've still not got it right, I would say, but it is the process that is recognized now that developing a robust management systems is key to all of this. So I apologize for having gone three, four minutes over my allotted 30 minutes, but I think that is the last of these slides. And I want to thank all of you for 
listening and for your attention and look forward to the discussion around these issues. Thank you, Ryder, for the wonderful presentation and also for providing us with the clarity and feedback on some of the comparator IFI processes related to the environmental and social risk assessment study. And in particular, the issues related to the four tier dynamic risk categorization, as well as the suggestion that efforts and requirements be proportionate to project risk, scale and complexity. I'd also like to thank Director Bruce Dunn for framing and contextualizing this discussion. We hope we can get further feedback from you on what the ADB should consider in these general policy topics and areas during the facilitated Q&A that's coming up. This session, as I mentioned, will run for about 70 minutes, but there is flexibility in that. So with that, let's pause for a bit of a five minute break. Before we do, and while you're on break, I'd just like to advise you of a poll that we will have coming up a bit later. Um, and that is going to be on menti.com. The poll is being flashed in the chat box now. And the question of this poll is, how can we specifically improve the level of engagement with you as stakeholders uh, during these consultations? What is it that you would like to see that we are not yet doing? And how can we ensure that uh, the way we engage, the methods of consultation, the schedules of consultation, the material that we send out, the way we present is um, enticing you and encouraging you to participate even more than you are now. Are there specific things that we may be overlooking or may have missed that you wish to provide us uh, advice and input on? Um, and if they are, please ensure that you respond to this in the menti.com poll, which we will have after the break. If you want to respond to the poll now, by all means, go ahead and do so but the poll will be open for at least the next three or four hours. After the break, we will have Ms. Zara Bas, a principal environment specialist who will frame the discussion and set the context for the Q&A session, and then lead us into the session directed by Felix Oku, uh, another senior development, social development specialist within the SDCC. So you will see the next slide, we have the guide questions that we will leave on during the break. At the top right hand corner of those guide questions, there is a countdown timer. When that countdown timer reaches zero, you'll know that the break's over and we're about to resume the consultation. We'll also have some background music playing. And as that music begins to fade away, it's also an indication to return to your screens. So with that, let's pause for a five minute break and we'll see you all shortly.
Thanks very much and welcome back. We will now have a framing of the risk-based approach that Ryder spoke about and that ADB may be considering as presented by Ms. Zara Abbas, a principal environment specialist within the safeguards division. This context will lead into the environmental and social risk ass assessment study discussions as facilitated by Felix Oku. Uh, so Zara will pass directly to Felix. Without any further delay then, let's start with Ms. Zara Abbas. Over to you, please, Zara. Thank you, Azim. <clears throat> Good day, everybody. Um, I will just, uh, <clears throat> as uh, Azim said, we'll uh, discuss uh, how, what are the next steps, how is ADB going to uh, proceed, and uh, linking to what Ryder just discussed. So uh, in, in his previous presentation, uh, Ryder just uh, explained, and you heard about uh, how uh, the risk assessment and management approach, uh, had, how it has become good practice over the years. And uh, in order to consider the impacts and uh, <clears throat> risks of development projects. So uh, to implement an integrated approach for risk assessment and management, ADB will align with the practice adopted by comparator MFIs. And we have identified some areas for strengthening. I will just run through these. <clears throat> You can see this uh, the slide now. Yes. So uh, there are the need. There's a need for uh, an integrated risk-based classification of projects. Uh, there's a need to strengthen the environmental and social impact assessment, um, and to introduce adaptive risk management, and strengthen safeguards oversight. The function of safeguards oversight. And uh, to have to build a robust capacity uh, for borrowers and ADB for uh, in 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 order to implement this. So I'll just briefly go through these points. Uh, currently, uh, ADB undertakes significance-based classification of projects separately across environment, in voluntary resettlement, and indigenous people's safeguards. And the most sensitive component determines the overall category. So this uh, means that uh, for environment, for involuntary resettlement, and for indigenous peoples, a separate category is assigned for each. Uh, in the revised policy, we will consider an integrated risk-based classification system in which there will be one integrated categorization undertaken across all safeguard standards. <clears throat> based on the location, nature, scale of impacts, and most importantly, factoring in borrower's capacity and other contextual risks. As mentioned by Ryder just now, uh, this approach is now followed by most of our comparator MFIs. <clears throat> As part of the environmental assessment process, <clears throat> the current uh, practice is uh, to screen, uh, categorize, and assess project impacts will need to be revised and adapted to incorporate an approach that considers the interlinkages between uh, not just uh, um, then uh, not just the environmental impacts but also integrate social uh, impacts and risks and that is um, that would mean that there would need to be a greater focus or more attention would need to be uh, directed to how the social impacts that result from this can be uh, integrated into this overall process and assessed, assessed accordingly and have uh, mitigation options and measures built into the project to address it. So, uh, and in view of these interlinkages, uh, guidance for integrated social and environmental uh, impacts assessment will also need to be strengthened. So currently, the social uh, risks are as assessed as part of the social impact assessment or as part of the, um, the, the, the initial poverty assessment, uh, and, but they need to be integrated more into the overall uh, assessment process. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So uh, here I will briefly introduce the next steps that we will be taking to introduce risk management as an approach. Uh, so most importantly, to ensure the delivery of safeguards outcomes, uh, ADB uh, needs to focus on strengthening project implementation as well as supervision. 
to implement risk assessment and management, uh, ADB will need to apply the principle of adaptive risk management. And this involves uh, ongoing monitoring uh, and the ability to be able to respond to unforeseen circumstances that lead to uh, impacts. <clears throat> And linked to this is the need to also develop guidance on how to balance pre-approval requirements with actions that can be undertaken later based on the level of risk during project implementation. As Ryder just explained, more effort would be needed for high-risk projects in earlier in the due diligence phase, as well as during implementation. And this would involve closer supervision and tighter management. Based uh, on the nature and risk of the project, uh, actions that may be undertaken at a later stage need to be agreed upon with the borrower and then reflected as conditions in legal agreements uh, to ensure implementation of those measures. Uh, at the moment, the World Bank is uh, doing this as uh, in the form of an environment and, and social commitment plan, which is legally binding on the borrower. So, uh, so now while having a new approach um, um, for this and also having guidance is very important, uh, it is equally important or very important, I would say, to strengthen ADB safeguards oversight, which will require robust risk management systems. And these, these include um, appropriate safeguard staffing, uh, staffing structure and staffing resources, performance indicators, tracking and performance monitoring tools, so we have recently developed um, and uh, are implementing a project performance rating system. Um, and also uh, we are in the process of developing an integrated safeguards management system for tracking the implementation of project level safeguards. So, um, and we also expect that by the time the policy revision is completed and the update has happened, ADB will also have reviewed and assessed the staffing resource requirements. So lastly, a comprehensive policy implementation plan will be developed uh, for capacity building and establishing strategic partnerships. This will cater to the needs of all stakeholders. Uh, now this includes, of course, the executing agencies that oversee everything and implementing agencies uh, involved in the field level implementation of projects contractors that are uh, on the ground doing the work and consultants or supervision engineers, supervision consultants who are also um, doing the uh, implementation or involved in it very closely. And partnerships with other MFIs will be strengthened uh, around the standards and their implementation and essentially for capacity building and learning from each other's experiences and uh, training uh, resources. Um, additionally, policy guidance, good practice notes, and other tools for implementation will also be developed. Um, next slide, please. So here on this slide, we have the questions that were shared with you earlier. So we expect that with this background uh, of the topic, which is provided in a lot of detail by Ryder, and um, the brief uh, um, presentation that I uh, gave you on how we're considering to incorporate this, we would like to hear your perspectives on how to better identify the various types of risk factors, um, address risk as an ongoing feature throughout project uh, life cycle, and also on how to assess the risks of undertaking safeguards due diligence uh, of certain components at a later date. So we've put these points in the form of these questions, and we hope that this will guide the discussion forward. Um, if you have any questions, you can start entering them in the chat box already, or you can raise your hand. I will now just directly pass over to Felix Oku, who will carry this discussion forward and moderate this. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that very detailed discussion. A context uh, to the Q&A session uh, there, Zara. Um, and on that note, let me welcome all of you to the most uh, interesting part of the uh, consultation process, in my opinion, 
Uh, that's the moderated Q&A session. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of presentations from the ADB side, uh, right from the introductory uh, session by Bruce, that would followed by a very detailed discussion there by Ryder on the benchmarking uh, exercise that has been done so far. And Zara concluded with the uh, context on the next steps uh, following those recommendations and highlights from the um, benchmarking exercise. Um, today, we'd like to hear your feedback. ADB really appreciates your feedback in a in form of comments, just suggestions, questions, um, or even criticisms. Um, all of it are welcome. We, we believe that a meaningful consultation could only strengthen um, the update of the SPS process. So to enhance that process, um, there is simultaneous uh, translation languages. Uh, for this beyond English language, you could have your question um, or feedback provided in Russian. You could do that also in Hindi, and you could also do that in, in the Urdu. <coughs> um, so you're not obliged at all if English is not your uh, preferred language of choice. You could ask the question directly in any of those three languages that I've mentioned and the simultaneous translation would enable us to provide a response to you accordingly. How could you do that? You could do that by raising of your hand, uh, using the reactions um, button on the bottom right hand side corner of the screen. If you're using, um, you could then raise your hand and we could call you. You could also put a question um, in the chat box as well and we'll follow up on, on that one. Uh, we've noticed there's been some question that has already been sent ahead, which we're very, very grateful to. We'll uh, have to indulge your patience. Uh, we'd like to hear everyone, and we've got 70 minutes allocation uh, to do the Q&A. So um, we'll acknowledge if you hold your hand or put a chat, just bear with us and we'll make sure everyone is heard. Um, the order of picking the questions or addressing the questions will be, we'll take um, questions that has been sent in advance, uh, where there are raised hands as well, we'd like to go to um, the hands that have been raised, and then that will follow by questions that have been put in the chat box. If at all possible, we like to put faces to the names. So if you're on the call, um, I would always urge you that you mute your microphone and then put a video on so we could um, engage with you going forward in a very meaningful way. Okay, so without much ado, uh, let's uh, try and open up. And I urge all of you to be quite very participatory in this consultation process. Our key speakers there from Bruce, um, Raida, we go, um, Zera, we go Madhu, and um, um, if Charles joins as well, are quite very keen to give you detailed responses to any questions you may have. So this is your, uh, your session. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to pick maybe the first question that has been sent to us because I've not seen any hands raised yet. And that has to do with um, coming from Myra, but Myra is a policy engagement specialist Osfam in the UK. And Myra's question um, is how can community-led approaches strengthen investment in ADB projects, uh, community-driven projects? Um, how can they strengthen investment, I guess, in, uh, in investment? It could be ADB projects. And maybe in the first instance, I'll post that to a uh, writer, if you're on a call. Excellent. Thank you, Felix. So I, I take the question to mean the emphasis on what has sometimes been called community-driven development projects or community-led approaches, small, sometimes smaller scale, uh, where resources and decision-making authority is basically in the hands of local communities in different ways, with support from government agencies or others. Uh, I think we've seen really excellent examples of this uh, in the last, oh, I at least 20 years since, since I've been involved in those types of projects. Uh, when I lived in India, I, I, one of the most interesting things I did was I coordinated on behalf of the World Bank a program called Swashakti, which, mean, which was in, in Hindi, power. Uh, rural Women's Development and Empowerment Project, we had 17,000 sub-projects, and this was facilitated and managed in partnership with 700 NGOs across the country in nine different states. And it was very powerful, and I thought impactful in terms of 
involving and empowering local women, local poor women, both economically and socially, and accessing services and uh, rights and entitlements. So there's a number of examples like this. Uh, there are some caveats, of course, challenges with community-led, community-driven approaches. Uh, decisions, decisions are all, not always made in a balanced manner. There is still a danger of elite capture sometimes. And uh, assessing different risks uh, remains important, but the risks of large-scale negative impacts are reduced significantly. But I would like to also sort of add to this, which I very strongly support, that even more traditional, larger, say, infrastructure projects or national health programs or whatever it may be, uh, I would say they require active community participation and involvement of different stakeholders. Uh, there are processes, of course, on stakeholder engagement that go from traditional no information to one-way information and dissemination to two-way dialogue to participatory approaches, uh, approaches and empowerment with transfer of decision-making uh, roles in different settings. An example of empowerment would be the application of free prior informed consent in the case of some projects affecting indigenous peoples. And so I think the principle of involving through appropriate stakeholder analysis and engagement involving local communities, recognizing that communities are not homogeneous, uh, that there may be gender differences, uh, there needs to be maybe special attention to persons with disabilities and so on. But that principle I think is well established and should only be strengthened. Thank you very much there, Ryla, for that um, data response to the question. I'm sure um, Myra, um, who is not on the call at the moment, um, would would uh, you know if if you if if maybe you've got any follow up question, please feel free to reach out to us uh, on the responses that Ryder has given over there. I think it's getting a bit excited now. I can see a hand that has been raised. Um, and just to follow up, I'd like to call Iromi Perara, Bank Information Center. You put your hand raised up. Romy, if you don't mind, you could unmute the microphone and then uh, give the video on so we could put a face to the name. You have the platform here, Romy. Oh, thank you so much, Felix. Um, unfortunately, I'm having a power cut right now, so it's a little difficult for me to put my video on. I apologize. No, um, that's but, okay. Um, so I have two comments and a question. Um, so maybe I'll just start with the comments and um, they are more focused on the... Uh, the strengthening inclusion and addressing vulnerabilities question. Um, I know that the, the, the ADB team has probably gone through the two documents that Vic has already sent through, but for uh, the purposes of this consultation, I thought I would raise um, two particular points with regard to the risk assessments. Uh, one comment is with regard to child rights and the other is regard to disability rights. Um, so we, we recommend that in any risk assessment or any kind of assessment, basically for there to be explicit reference to groups who might be disproportionately impacted. So for example, not collapsing everyone into one, the term vulnerable groups, but explicitly mentioning persons with disabilities and uh, children so that they the differentiated impacts on them can be incorporated into the various assessments uh, and that that by using by explicitly referencing them also that means that uh, the borrower is bound to then capture all of this in the various assessment material um, and with regard to children we also recommend to disaggregate the project data by age um, to improve the outcomes for children so any assessments and data collection basically conducted right throughout the project cycle to disaggregate by age so that all, because some of the differentiated impact can vary by age. And as it was also discussed in the presentation on intersectionality, um, so looking at also more severe impacts on child-headed households or children with disabilities, for example. Um, 
with regard to the categorization of projects and identifying risks, we recommend including uh, specifically gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and harassment, including child uh, SEA. Um, again, explicit reference as the, uh, of these as things that should be included in the uh, risk assessment. With regard to disability, uh, persons with disabilities, again, we uh, recommend explicit reference as opposed to assuming that these will be captured under the vulnerabilities group, uh, sort of a blanket statement there. Um, and sort of putting this right throughout the project cycle as well, same with what we have recommended for child rights. Um, and my, uh, so those are two, my, my two comments with regard to how to strengthen the assess the risk assessments and other sort of measurement tools. My question is with regard to um, the first presentation where, uh, uh, where it said that there would be collection, a recommendation basically to collect baseline data. Um, and that, I think that was point number six in that chart. And then later on point number 10, it was monitoring evaluation. Um, and I wondered if since baseline data is being collected, whether there is a plan to also include endline data and what that time period would be like. Um, so to see what the project impacts have been at the end of the project, um, in addition to seeing the impact throughout the project cycle. And if there is collection of endline data, what would be the time period like after the project end, uh, as well as what would be the procedures in place to address the findings of the end line data collection? Um, so yes, that is my question uh, for this session. Thank you very much, um, Hiromi. I think uh, this is quite, I mean, very grateful for the two comments that you passed there. Um, clearly, you uh, they linked risk assessment uh, categorization and an assessment as well. So whatever is categorized, um, the risk assessment is, is informed by the level of uh, categorization that's been assessed to it. And the two areas that you mentioned, that has to do with child rights and uh, disability rights. Um, you want explicit references to these vulnerable groups, um, not just lumbering them into areas of vulnerabilities so we could correctly assess the disproportionate impact that, that, they, that they have. Um, and then um, I would I would tend to send this to uh, Ryder in the first instance. Uh, those comments, I mean, I'm sure Ryder will have a retort to that, um, especially with the intersectionality um, and even disaggregating with aging. I mean, quite very specific comments there. So that will go to Ryder in the first uh, first attempt. And then your question to do with. Uh, you said slide six and slide 10 slices had to do with collection of baseline data um, and monitoring and evaluation. Do you want whether endline data um, will be collected? And if it would, what's the mechanism and approach to assess uh, the outcomes of the, of the project? So I, I would post that to Ryder in the first instance. And then I'm sure Madhu internally would also want to touch because we talk about um, with categorization, also GBV, uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment that you mentioned, including child sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment as well. So over to you in the first instance, Ryder, and then there will be a follow-up uh, from Madhu. Uh, thank you. I think these are excellent comments and, and a very interesting question that uh, with more time, I would have loved to go into more detail on the baseline data and uh, different points in time. On the explicit reference to particular groups, uh, you only mentioned children, children's rights, persons with disabilities, other groups. I, uh, well, this is a personal opinion and, and the final outcome, of course, uh, would need to be negotiated at many different levels. But I find it a strength uh, when the policy frameworks can be explicit about these issues and have indicative list of types of vulnerabilities that should be looked at. 
I agree that if you just lump everything into a general term and have nothing more than saying disadvantaged and vulnerable groups, there is a danger that some groups may be overlooked. This is, of course, sensitive in many areas. Issues around sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, where that is sensitive or even uh, homosexuality being prohibited by law in some countries we know of, exactly how you write a policy statement uh, explicitly mentioning those issues would need to be negotiated. And there have been compromises, as we know, in, in how that language has been framed. I would certainly say that uh, an indicative list strengthens the attention. Uh, I would caution against seeing an indicative list of different identities as being complete. The danger of having an indicative list is that people sort of use it mechanically as a checklist and don't often don't go beyond that. So I would still stress the overall principles of disaggregating impacts and opportunities by different stakeholder groups and being open to dynamics uh, that we may not have anticipated. And issues vary by context to context. Uh, disaggregating or dis considering discrimination on the basis of caste may be relevant in one country or region, maybe not so much in other regions. Uh, Gender-based violence, sexual exploitation, abuse, harassment. Again, this is something that was not paid enough attention to in the past. I think the multilateral institutions are coming up with additional guidance on this, but sometimes a bit after the fact, after policy frameworks have been developed, I think there would be a strengthening if more explicit reference to this could come into the actual statement on it. And uh, just a one quick point on gender in a broad sense, whether it is attention to gender-based violence, broadly speaking also, or sexual orientation, gender identity. These are concerns that are relevant across all settings. Caste may not be relevant in all, all contexts. Uh, there are not indigenous peoples in all project settings, but gender is a differentiating factor and age is a differentiating factor in all settings. So to the extent that policy language could be explicit uh, in its attention to those considerations, I think we would add value uh, to the overall. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about balancing baseline data and seeing endline data, but uh, why don't we ask Madhu also to come in and, and supplement this, uh, knowing more about the considerations within the ADB than I do. Thank you, yes. I, you know, I mean, I definitely, you know, value, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the professional judgment uh, that you have, but I think I can give some perspective that ADB is currently thinking of. As you know, you know, and uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, when I go to a project cycle, the way ADB processes projects are a bit different. Uh, normally, what we start with an initial poverty uh, social analysis, which actually identifies these vulnerabilities. And if you really look at the definition of vulnerable groups, it was meant to cover actually everyone. But the issue where we find the problem internally is, and in our projects is, the, the amount of um, emphasis and the due diligence that is needed actually to strengthen the social impact assessment or the integrated social uh, environmental and social impact assessment. And um, my take and, and institutionally also we are discussing, and I agree with Ryder that Explicit, explicit mention draws attention and Borwa would cover it, but it can also become a kind of a very mechanical chest, checklist. So what is really important, what we are thinking internally is, what is the right way to approach so that systematically the issues of vulnerability are identified, assessed, and mitigation measures are covered and you know, in, you know, taken care of or along the project cycle. So what we are really thinking of is discussing rather internally in terms of, okay, should we expand the definition of vulnerable groups to include uh, the whole uh, list, 
But then, you know, our policy also has to stand the test of time, maybe another 10 years, 12 years, there might be newer vulnerabilities. So how do you address that? So what should be the optimal definition of vulnerable groups? So that's the current discussion ongoing. And obviously, we are also uh, you know, trying and assessing benchmarking actually against the other MFIs, trying to understand the pros and cons of the situation and also align it with our own internal uh, business processes and uh, systems that we have in the institution. So I will not say yes, we will include, we will not include, we are just still exploring it. That's where I would stop. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Raida and uh and Madhu uh, for giving, um, you know, broader objectives and the internal business processes surrounding how we address these vulnerability risk factors um, in our projects, uh, project preparation and processing implementation phases. We, we still got some hands raised up um, and I'd like to call on... Um, so, sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Uh, there was a question on baseline data and monitoring also yes perhaps we could address yep i mean if you if, we, if you take i thought um probably maybe you earlier one touched uh, touched on it but then if you could take it maybe give it a bit, a bit more um detailed elaboration no that'd be good i mean um uh Renine's question was um would like to have know whether uh big we will call it baseline data and if we do um whether that would focus on end line data and what the timelines will be um for both monitoring evaluation. Um, just want to know the mechanisms and approach that would use that to assess uh, project outcomes. Yeah, no, just to be very quick, I mean, that that is an assumption in a good assessment and management process that baseline data are collected. Uh, good practice would indicate that communities and different stakeholders are involved in defining those data through participatory definition of indicators, what's meaningful in a local context spiritual values that may be affected, other aspects, tangible and non-tangible, uh, that we should monitor against in terms of potential risks and how the project manages those over time. There's basically three levels to this. There's monitoring as an ongoing management process against, against these issues. There's intermittent supervision and oversight that ADB as an institution would do, focusing more on performance results, verification of monitoring reports. And then there is what uh, I think was referred to end results data evaluations should be done by independent experts where possible. It may be typically done both at project midterm to make adjustments as necessary and certainly at an end and completion of a project. And that would focus on higher level outcomes and impacts and overall sustainability and confirming precisely what the point that was made was do we know when can we verify that we have achieved the appropriate mitigation of adverse impacts and that there has been no net harm done to people or the environment? And as we said, ideally, net positive gain. So you'd want to verify this uh, in different methodologies throughout the project, but certainly through an end of life, end of lifetime evaluation. Sorry to take time on that, but I think it is important. Very, very important. I agree with you, uh, Ryder. And if you, Romy, if you're on the call, just want to check with you that um, you think your question has been sufficiently addressed. Um, yes and no. I guess my final question, which was that, are you also looking at uh, policies or any kind of procedures to address the outcomes of the end of project results, these monitoring, say, if you do find that some harm has been done or there are some issues that have occurred at the end or once a project is over, what is then the procedure to address the impacts of those, your findings from the study, basically? Thanks. Oh. Okay, thank you. So right if I may come back to you quickly on that one. Should the end line date evaluation show that there's been some harm caused by the project or component activities? Um, are we looking to first of all mainstream any processes to establish if these harms have been caused by the project and what will be done uh, following should project come to closure you know felix my suggestion would perhaps be that bruce is in a better position to respond to that and i think he's indicated excellent could do so over to you bruce yes thank you felix i'm happy to speak to that one and uh 
Thank you so much, Iromi, for joining today. Always great to have you in these sessions and great questions. So yeah, a couple of quick points here. Um, one, you know, the current process is to do a end of project review through our project completion reports. And those completion reports need to look at the implementation of st and status of the safeguards based on the monitoring reports, but also through final um, field level and document evaluation. And that goes into the um, project completion reports. Those completion reports are then uh, further reviewed and validated by our independent evaluation department. That sort of goes off on a separate track. Um, but at a project level, any identified issues that have not been addressed then do need to be addressed. And actually the um, loan covenants continue actually to um, be in place and, and should ensure that any non-addressed issues are addressed. But you then run into a number of issues that we need to think about more how to address them. Uh, should a project close if there are outstanding issues? Um, also project implementation schedules for infrastructure projects tend to be, be completed at the stage of um, the, the primary construction works. And, and then as you go into longer term operations where you might still have uh, further impacts, for example, on livelihoods and where those impacts do not uh, become apparent maybe for some years, that certainly leads you to the question about how do you start to monitor those issues in the longer term? So it, it's something we need to look at. I think there's a, a couple of things we're thinking about now but have not, not finalized. Um, one is we need to, to make it clear in terms of the assessment processes uh, and documentation requirements at project closure. And we also need to think through um, what's often being termed as responsible exit. Um, now, responsible exit can come in in situations where you might uh, close or um, have to come out of the project early, but it also comes into place um, at, at a, a regular project closure time in terms of had the conditions been made right to be able to, to close the project at that stage. So these are things that we're thinking about, starting to discuss internally, but need to um, develop further language and procedures in the new policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bruce. I um, think uh, probably uh, Rumi will be uh, okay now um, for that last bit of the question. If you're in the call, I'm quite keen to get uh, your feedback. Is it, you think it's been addressed now? Yes, it has. Thank you. And I'll just put another comment in response to Bruce so that others can also uh, give their comments. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much for being here. Um, so we move on to the next one. And um, we've got a hand raised. Um, Nalini Vas, Site Savers International India. Uh, apologies for keeping you hold, uh, waiting, no, uh, but you've got a floor now. So if you unmute and uh, put the video on, that'll be grateful. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry about my video. I also have a shaky bandwidth. I hope that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm, it, it's more a comment um, building on, uh, uh, you know, both Ryder and Iromi. Uh, Ryder mentioned about projects benefiting some groups more than others. And Iromi also um, raised, um, you know, mentioning persons with disability explicitly. And um, so um, I, I, uh, I would say that, for instance, embedding universal design principles into all projects with infrastructure components would be really critical because accessibility is one of the key pieces of work that persons with disability are advocating around. So uh, whether it is a transportation project, um, accessible classrooms, um, accessibility in all its forms, and therefore universal design becomes design principles Bills become become so critical. Um, that that is one part of it, and the other part is is um, you know mentioned with the with stakeholder engagement and the emphasis uh, not just in the preparatory phase but also during project implementation. So engaging with organisations of persons with disability on an ongoing basis and also making sure that that engagement is meaningful in terms of providing uh, reasonable accommodation to the different disability groups that might 
might want to uh, participate in the stakeholder engagement would also be really critical. Uh, so these are uh, two points I thought I'd share. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciative of that, Nalini. And um, just to get it right, um, you know, giving what you say, giving that uh, project benefits uh, go to intended beneficiaries it differently and touching back on um, the Rumi's question on uh, disability and group as vulnerable groups. You, What you're proposing is a universal design principles. And if we could incorporate that as part of project design and with strong emphasis on accessibility and uh, stakeholder engagement and with reference to the uh, disability people, it should be ongoing and uh, it, sh it shouldn't stop until the outcomes have been achieved. Um, let me see assets and the design principles. Um, I will go to maybe Ryder, uh, if you if you don't mind, in the first instance, um, incorporating universal design principles, leveraging on accessibility and continuous stakeholder engagement process to ensure meaningful consultation has been achieved. And then maybe Bruce may want to touch on it or, or, or Madhu. Over to you, Ryder. Now, just uh, specifically on the on the principle of universal access, uh, again, I totally agree here with Nalini. It's something that we've not done well enough in the past, uh, but this is now being incorporated into more standard policy frameworks among the multilateral financial institutions. The World Bank's Environmental and Social Framework, for example, which became effective in 2018, defines universal access and specifies that that is to be in, uh, incorporated in new infrastructure buildings, other types of infrastructure, defining it as unimpeded access for people of all ages and abilities. So it's not just uh, those with physical disabilities, for example, but also other otherwise abled or persons with disabilities with access. One of the challenges in terms of access to information and consultation processes, perhaps where we, I think we can use a lot more advice and guidance from those who have expertise in this area is also to involve people of different mental abilities in the process where there has been far less attention than, than uh, what should have been placed on that. Maybe others would like to comment also. Uh, yeah, maybe probably I would uh, go to uh, Madhu. Um, internally within ADB, um, as part of um, vulnerable end uses of project facilities, including infrastructure-based, um, universal access to uh, project um, you know, facilities and then of also ensuring stakeholder engagement process is ongoing to uh, maintain that the intended outcomes um, are achieved. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, it would be good to, I mean, we do have a disability framework that is uh, not uh, done from our safeguards division, but they are working on, you know, what should be the direction when it comes to disability. So there is a lot of work that's ongoing. And as I said, you know, in the project cycle, we also have a process of what we call the poverty social assessment. And that phase actually look at, looks into all of these aspects, that how through a process of stakeholder consultation, design improvement, one can ensure that the benefits of the project, you know, go to all of them. And this also is one of a critical aspect that is dealt at that point of time. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, yes, World Bank, I know, has made it part of the safeguard policy. Uh, but in case of ADB, we do make those assessments. A lot of the times what happens is when we design a project, uh, the issues of cost also come in. And uh, there is also a bit of negotiation, actually, in at the practical level of the project that takes place in terms of cost, in terms of how this thing can be achieved. But as I said, it's a work in progress and it's incremental. There are discussions going on, uh, but in terms of, you know, uh, you know, considering this as, this is something that is uh, currently being discussed at length within ADB. 
uh, in terms of direction, in terms of the tools, in terms of the assessment, this is also being developed. And for that, what we are trying to do is also improve the poverty social assessment process tools, how we can keep our staff, staff better and borrowers better to actually understand and assess these risks and vulnerabilities. So I can only uh, give that direction at the moment, but I do agree it's a very, very important aspect because a lot of the things can actually be dealt at the design stage by having a very good design, like even for resettlement, avoiding impacts is very crucial. Similarly, giving access, having accessibility for everyone is very, very important. Mm. Yeah. I there is a one maybe offshoot uh, on the principles that uh, Nalini mentioned and has to do with stakeholder engagement. Um, I'm not sure maybe Bruce, we want to come on, touch a little bit on um, what is probably maybe envisioned in, in the new update. Uh, it cuts across board, but with, with specific reference to some of these vulnerable end groups that has been discussed. Over to you, Bruce. Yes, um, thank you, Felix. And thank you, Nalina, really. Um important comments that were made there. Um, I'll just note that the discussions around stakeholder engagement, which we had a separate consultation on this um, raised also um, very similar issues and we've taken note of that and, and agree. I think the, the whole process of stakeholder engagement needs to be strengthened. The existing policy you know, talks about meaningful consultation, but there's really not a lot of depth and detail in the policy or the requirements and we've been looking across other MFI frameworks and we certainly see the need to strengthen the whole stakeholder um, identification process, link that to more comprehensive stakeholder engagement plans, uh, the need to ensure that this links also to um, you know the wider um, poverty and social analysis process that we've been talking about, you know, identification of uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged groups for then more focused inclusion in the process and thinking about how to facilitate um, appropriate engagement uh, with those individuals and groups and the modalities that are needed. And I think this is something that you've brought out well, Nalina, and also uh, Iromi Pereira in, in this session, but also in other sessions speaking about disability, that um, you're not going to be able to um, engage necessarily People you know, with disabilities come in many different um, forms from physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities. And of course, you um, need to, to customize engagement processes uh, accordingly. So that's something I think where um, we need to give consideration to in, in the policy framework, but also a lot more to be done in terms of guidance and building uh, capacity and practice. At, at the local levels. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done around sensitization um, and training with um, you know, our developing member countries and clients around the implementation of this. Um, so yeah, certainly well recognized and something that we'd um, like to incorporate. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Um, Irumi, we just want to acknowledge the follow-up uh, question you put in the chat box there that has to do with um, the uh, end line data, you're not talking just about harm, but you also want to see how the indicators have changed for communities from the beginning of the project to the end. So you want to compare uh, project beginning to project end and see how uh, there's been maybe uh, hopefully net gain in the project development outcomes for the affected communities. Uh, we've, we've, we've noticed that. We would uh, continue, and if Nina Lassikina from Bankwatch, uh, Bank Network, Bankwatch Network is on the call, um, you've got a question on disclosure of monitoring reports in local languages. If you're on the call, you may unmute and yes. um, maybe give it yes. a, bit, a bit more clarification. Okay, over to you, Nina. You get a call. Yes, thank you, Felix. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear. Yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, actually, that was my command uh, based on the previous one regarding the, the monitoring that quite often we see the situation when there is no information about the uh, project monitoring, which is difficult not only for the affected communities, but mainly for the affected communities, but also for the international civil society organizations 
which oversee the public investments really to follow the uh, the project implementation and you know because when we have the meetings with the with the ADB we always see that no your concerns are not grounded it's it's not like that we have our monitoring reports and everything is going to be fine or it, everything is, is fine but we don't have a I mean, we, we've never seen the, the monitoring reports to say or to argue with that. And quite often we have the information from the ground, which says the opposite. So what I'm saying that it would be really great and important to disclose this information, especially in the local languages and especially in non-democratic countries where it's quite often the only source of you know, information to ensure public monitoring and public control over the project, especially when it comes to the uh, to the uh, um, public clients. So that's that's my point, and I hope you will you will address. Thank you. Yes, uh, Nina, your point is very well made. Um, it's about disclosure of monitoring reports, uh, affected communities, and other interested parties. Um, from your experience. The feedback you're getting from the ground seem to not be in tangent with what you tend to get with project teams in ADB um, and whether that is, is going to be an approach that will be taken forward, especially in non-democratic countries, that's the only source of information for affected communities. So maybe I'll go to Bruce in the first instance um, and then maybe we could add, add a uh, touch on um, over to you, Bruce. Yeah, thank you, Felix. And um, thank you so much, uh, Nina, for joining today and for, for that important question. Actually, it, um, it links to and, and reinforces the point also that uh, Iromi um, Pereira had put the additional question in the chat, if you haven't seen that. So maybe we can cover those together. Ryder may also like to come in a little bit later on some other international experiences and good practices on this. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that Often, there's been misplaced focus on just disclosure through, say, ADB's website. You know, we, we need to have clear provisions for disclosure um, through ADB and through our website. That's very important. But, of course, that is in a, um, a form and a place that may not be as accessible to local people as it needs to be. And I think that's the, the really critical issue there. Um, the disclosure of documentation, whether it's assessment reports, uh, stakeholder engagement plans, monitoring reports, it really does need to come down to that local level. That's where the project is being implemented. So um, we do need to, to look at that. Um, I think it needs to be developed at a project level. Um, we may need to have some language that, of course, you know, triggers the need for this, but every project situation is different. And I, and I think that's where uh, stakeholder engagement plans need to be broader looking at the entire project cycle. That, that's something that we've been talking about. So a, a thorough stakeholder engagement process looks at not only consultation, but also feedback loops, regular uh, communications, and the linkage to things like grievance redress mechanisms. Um, now that that's quite complex to bring together and there's a lot of capacity that's needed to improve practice there. So, um, you know, again, I think we, we do need some policy triggers, but we certainly need to have guidance and working down at the project level um, with clients and in different country circumstances. Um, there's also a, of course, a feedback loop to the types of risk assessments that we were talking about earlier. Um, and, and you, I think, Nina, are making also this um, kind of um, point in, in your statement. You know, in, in countries or circumstances where, where governance is weak, where disclosure is weak, maybe where you're in conflict situations, obviously the ability to get that information out at local levels is more challenging. So the risk and then the feedback into the stakeholder engagement process um, needs to be strengthened. But, I, I do think a lot of this is around strengthening the operational procedures. As, as much as we need the policy, it's, it's really um, strengthening the, the focus on implementation, which will be really important here. Um, but I'd like to maybe check if, if Ryder, if you've got any comments from um, other MFIs or what you see as emerging good practice in this area so that we can learn from. Thank you. 
I have some examples. Uh, trying to think. Uh, one of the things that we did, which was new from 2012 at the IFC when I was coordinating these policies there, that was the first time we had explicitly incorporated, for example, the principle of free prior informed consent. Um, and it, it was a new topic of verifying this. And I think it taught us a number of things. It, and we documented this in several circumstances um, and have some examples on it, on the methodology used also. But I think it's important to stress you know, the principles of free prior informed consent may not apply in all circumstances. It is, it is focused on indigenous peoples in certain circumstances. But the free and available non-coercive information uh, the prior to consultation events, uh, sufficient time to consider and informed, meaning that it has to be in a format and a method that's meaningful and culturally appropriate locally, as I said, with appropriate uh, timing. All of those principles are essential in all settings, whether or not it ends in a consent situation. And so I think there's lessons learned from there with the methodologies. Um, but uh, but I don't have them sort of here and now. I, you know, I, I was involved in a project in Colombia uh, where they used illustrations, signage uh, of different kinds and had a lengthy process of engaging with an indigenous community where ethic was required. And uh, I was quite impressed with seeing how even the children of the community were able to explain the project, what was going to happen, what the measures to address their concerns were going to be. Um, so it was clearly a very transparent process. It's hard to achieve that in some settings, but there is emerging practice. And I did try to summarize, we did try to summarize some of these principles and elements, uh, including the feedback mechanisms in that publication that you, the Asian Development Bank, recently co-published with other multilateral financial institutions that sort of represents a common approach, a converging set of understandings around elements and principles without going into a lot of procedural detail of what a meaningful stakeholder engagement process should look like. I try to type the website link into the chat, but I'm having difficulty making it a live link, but it's a very short address. So if people are interested, they should be able to retype this into their browser. And it summarizes some of these things that I think ADB may want to consider making more explicit, both at the policy level and in procedures in the policy update. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce and uh, and Ryder for that uh, detailed explanation to the question uh, Nina raised. Uh, Nina, I just want to check with you. Do you feel your question has been sufficiently answered if you're on the call? Yep. Yes, thank you so much. Glad to hear. Um, thank you. Look, we've got like about five minutes more. Um, if anyone has any burning question um, that you still want to ask, if you've got any comments you still want to make, um, maybe we can spare about five more minutes before we wrap up and then uh, hand over for the next, uh, uh, you know, actions to end this consultation process. So if um, if you have anyone, uh, we've not seen any coming in the chat yet. Um, I can't see any hands that has been raised uh, yet, uh, but if if you have anyone, it will be your, your time now. Um, five, it could be four minutes as a, as a speak. Uh, so over to you. We're quite very happy to still welcome one or two questions um, if you if you so wish. Otherwise, then we may have to uh, proceed to um, to the wrap up of the of, of today's session. Before we do the wrap up, um, because I can't see any more questions, any more hands. Um, I'm sure. Um, those that have asked their questions already. Um, no, I can see something from Ashley Derrick. I mean, a loud environment would like to ask a question over over the chat. Yeah, feel free to post your question in the chat box and we will pick it up. Um, let me see whether I can see that in the chat. Yeah, can you share how reprisals risks are assessed through the project that uh, during pre during and post project and how it is taken into account. So reprisals, um, I'll come to um, Bruce. Um, reprisals are project during project uh, preparation, especially during project implementation where there are complaints and people need to voice out 
and even during pro uh, project uh, closure. Over to you, in the, in the, uh, Bruce, in the first instance. Thank you, Felix, and thank you, Ashley. Um, the really important question, this has come up in other consultations as well. Um, firstly, in the current safeguard policy statement, under the definition of meaningful consultation, it highlights that you know, consultations can't be meaningful if there is um, coercion and intimidation. However, there's no specific reference in the policy framework around reprisals. Of course, uh, you know, a, any form of reprisal is, is a much more uh, severe form of you know, coercion and intimidation. It's you know, taking that another step further, and it's certainly not something that we would want to see or would support or condone. Um, and in cases where these issues have been raised, uh, we certainly investigate. Um, this, I think, though, moving forward, a need for a much more explicit reference in the new policy around um, certainly uh, non-tolerance for reprisals. And that would be in the policy statement for ABB, but also um, in reference to the requirements for borrowers. Uh, there is experience in this from uh, the other uh, multilateral financial institutions that do have explicit frameworks and guidance. So we are looking carefully at those. Um, there is some documentation also within the ADB, but it's not in our safeguard policy. Uh, for example, through our uh, anti-corruption and integrity policy, there are specific provisions for protection of whistleblowers. Uh, and also in the context of our accountability mechanism, uh, guidance has been developed around uh, maintaining confidentiality um, and addressing risks of reprisals. Uh, but that's guidance. It's not, not a specific policy framework. Uh, but in practice where allegations um, have come to the fore, they are normally passed on to our Office of Anti-Corruption and Integrity to do investigations, and then that's followed up through with um, our country offices and resident missions as appropriate. Uh, but again, we, we do think this needs explicit attention in the new policy. So that's something that we're planning to do. Thank you, Felix, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bruce. I can see right, I just posted a good practice note authored by the IFC and uh, Inter-American Development Bank. I, right, you wanna uh, touch a little bit on that? Well, uh, this is an area that, this is an area where we become increasingly aware and concerned over this. And I think the space for civil society, uh, for example, uh, has been restricted more and more in, in places. Uh, there's a particular concern and Global Witness produces a regular report on murders of human rights advocates mm. and uh, environmental defenders, for example, in project settings. So it's a real concern. The region with the highest level of this type of violence is Latin America and the Caribbean, where I do a lot of work, especially Colombia, but also other countries. Um, and so it's something that MFIs have become increasingly concerned with and aware of. So the Inter-American Development Bank that works in that region, along with IFC, co-published a good practice note on this very recently that I posted the link to. Uh, it, there is reference to this in more modern policy frameworks uh, without a whole lot of detail that needs to be elaborated further, perhaps in procedures and guidance, as Bruce indicated. The World Bank, for example, says that it is necessary to ensure that no external constraint or indirect coercion has been carried out either by an act of authorities or by an employer's practice in a project setting. So, so there is language that speaks to this, uh, but it is an area that requires training, capacity building, awareness uh, at many different levels. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ryder. Um, and um, I can see the note from Ashley. Derek, Ashley, you from the Coalition uh, for Human Rights and Development, uh, that you, you acknowledge that you you, uh, you, you got a feedback and you're happy with that. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking time to uh, come, especially on these Q&A sessions. I hope it's been meaningful and it's been helpful to address some of your issues. 
I would like to hand over now to Azim uh, for the wrap up and the concluding elements of this consultation process. Over to you, Azim. Thanks so much, Felix, uh, Ryder, Bruce, Zara, and Madhu, as well as others. But of course, insightful comments, the clarity of the questions, the sharing of experiences, and constructive feedback. I just want to reiterate that the comments on the environmental and social risks that are received from this consultation and thereafter will be considered in the final study report, which will in turn inform the revision of ADB standard and the updating of the safeguards policy statement. But as I mentioned prior to the break, please don't go on your screen. Please give us your feedback uh, and provide us your uh, views on how well and how successful this consultation specifically has gone. Give the consultation and your satisfaction of it a ranking from one to five. And we'd like to do that in the next 60 or 70 seconds, please. So if you could do that quite quickly. And a reminder that the menti.app poll will be available for at least the next three hours. So you can respond to that in due course as well. But first, give us a ranking of one to five on how satisfied you are with this particular consultation from one being um, there, from one being dissatisfied to five being the most satisfied. That ranking will allow us to see your level of uh, satisfaction and acceptance of this particular consultation. And then you can always go to the mentee.com app to provide more narrative feedback, providing three or four or five sentences as you wish on how specifically we can improve the levels of consultation. So if you have the opportunity now, please do so. Type in on your keypad a ranking of one to five to let us know how satisfied you are. And then as soon as we have that, we'll turn it over to Bruce Dunn again. So you can see that 80% of you said that this particular consultation scored four or better, but 20% scored it neutral. We're interested, as you said, Felix, at the beginning to know what the neutral and somewhat satisfied comments are and how specifically we can improve the level of engagement in this particular consultation and future consultations. What is it that we're doing well and what specifically can we do better to encourage your participation, feedback and responses and inputs into the safeguards policy statement. Thank you all. And I now bring you back to the director of SDCC uh, and this process in general, Mr. Bruce Dunn, to give us a summary of what we've heard and walk us through the next steps after this consultation. So Bruce, over to you, sir. Excellent. Thank you very much, Azim. And thank you once again for everyone joining today. It's um, really useful points and very well taken. I think by all of the ADB team today. Um, just in summary, I want to highlight again that uh, we are certainly looking at strengthening the whole approach to risk assessments at ADB, including um, additional focus on contextual risk analysis. We're also looking at strengthening the integration between the environmental and social issues and strengthening the focus on considering um, risks to vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. So just to, to set that as a, the framework. Uh, the other point I think clearly acknowledged by the team and coming out from uh, Ryder's presentation is the, the need uh, to, to really look across not just uh, project preparation, but across the entire project cycle and the linkage to uh, stakeholder engagement processes and management systems. Um, so that, that needs a more comprehensive focus. Um, now, there's some really great points that were raised and probably too many for me to um, summarize all the details, but I have um, about eight or nine points um, to just reference here. Uh, the first one that came up in the chat was around um, the increased focus on active participation and engagement of local communities. So I think that's absolutely uh, crucial and linked to the stakeholder engagement process. Uh, also, then we had a number of comments related to um, the need for more explicit reference to different vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. Um, it was clearly recommended that there should be that explicit reference, not just a broad 
reference to vulnerabilities. Um, though we did highlight that while an indicative list can be useful, there's always you know the local context, and we do need to make sure that we don't just go into a checklist approach. We need to assess comprehensively in the project context, the project affected area, uh, who are people with vulnerabilities, um, who are people that are disadvantaged, and, and make sure that that's integrated into the process. Uh, related to that, there was also a recommendation that um, uh, we need to focus more on disaggregated data. Um, we do already look at gender, but there was a recommendation also that uh, we disaggregate data by age. Uh, we had a number of points related to uh, consideration of um, people with disabilities, the need for um, universal access to be considered in project design, uh, the need to ensure engagement through the stakeholder uh, processes and consultation. Um, we also noted there that um, ADB has developed a disability framework and that there are linkages here to the poverty and social analysis process. Another issue raised was around uh, gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, this needs explicit consideration in the risk assessment process and then management in the project context. Uh, just to note, this is something we certainly agree on and ADB has already commenced work on developing uh, guidance notes for this topic. And we will be holding a separate consultation on uh, gender and safeguards and on um, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. So, so that's certainly an issue that um, we see as being important. Uh, we also talked about monitoring, uh, the need to um, certainly have good baseline data uh, collected, but then that needs to flow through um, the, the entire project cycle with monitoring, but then at the end. Um, also, there was recommendations around um, strengthening the disclosure of monitoring information, uh, particularly down to local levels and in local languages, um, making that connection to, to um, regular and ongoing stakeholder engagement processes. That's, that doesn't occur just up front. We need to engage throughout the project cycle, including with sharing monitoring information and data. Uh, we also came towards uh, looking at uh, responsible exit and then addressing the risks of reprisals. Um, so that's a number of the issues. I haven't covered all the details, but we will be, as usual, uh, making a summary of the consultation and making sure that we capture all of the key points. Uh, so again, these are all really well taken. Um, appreciate your recommendations today and appreciate your ongoing engagement in this process. Uh, for those of you that are interested in some of the upcoming sessions, uh, next week we will be doing a, a focus session for the Pacific and small island developing states where we'll be looking at how we apply uh, the environmental and social safeguards for fragile and conflict affected situations and then for small island developing states. Uh, so we'll be doing sessions for government and civil society on that topic. Uh, we're also planning to replicate that at a later stage for other regions, um, but we're starting with this one next week for the Pacific. Uh, I think the week after that, we've got sessions on uh, climate change, another risk area that needs to be covered. And then I think the week after that, we're going into country safeguard systems. Uh, so certainly a lot of topics coming up. And as I said, this is feeding into the development of the policy, uh, which we're aiming for a, a draft to be circulated by about September this year. So thanks once again for joining today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in future consultations. Until then, please stay safe and well. Take care. Thank you.